playground, uh, work zone, everything, you know? Absolutely. I mean, I know Carl knows what that's like too, trying to I've work out with some, kids running yeah. around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fun for now, right? It's fun for now. A yeah. couple My, weeks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll see how long we're in this thing. I know. So guys, yeah, yeah. Um, have you guys both been able to keep consistent with your workouts? I know you have, Carl. How about you, Mike? Yeah, it's probably easier now. Uh, it's just so accessible. It's right here, you know, and not to mention um, we've been doing just some filming of some at home stuff you can do with the assault equipment. So uh, lucky for me, I get to test out a lot of those workouts and film some stuff and just kind of give some tips. So keeps me on track. Absolutely. Well, we look forward to hearing a little bit about some of that today. Uh, guys in the chat box, if you could just make sure you're set to all panelists and attendees for me and pop in uh, and let me know, are you finding it easier or harder to work out at home at the moment? I know there's pros and cons. We'll give people like one more minute to arrive and then we'll really dig into the meat of the conversation, okay? Georgia, how are you? I'm great. I had a really good trading session this morning, actually. Uh, took a barbell out in the front patio, hung off my staircase for some scat pull-ups, did some one-arm push-ups in my kitchen. <laughs> so, I'm making do. I saw, uh, I saw Jacob walking down the stairs as you were doing RDLs. It was, they were Jefferson deadlifts, actually. Uh, oh, okay. If those were RDLs, I'd be really, really concerned. <laughs> I just I just got a glimpse at it. I don't even know if I saw the actual movement. Sorry. I just saw you hinging. I just don't want you to think that I deadlift like that. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything. I'm just like, yeah. Super really cat deadlift. back. Yeah, we're working around one another, but it's it's okay. Yeah, for sure. So guys, we'll uh, dive into the conversation here. So those that have been on for the last week or so, um, you've met Carl, you've met James, and I'm sure you've chatted with those guys before on calls or on the internet. Uh, but we're welcomed now today by Mike. Uh, he's coming to us from Assault Fitness. And uh, the reason we have him on today is OPEX and Assault have actually been doing some great work together recently uh, to provide some content for Assault's uh, education. Uh, they have an Assault University that they are in the process of launching online and James and Carl have uh, been filming some content for them on energy systems training on the air runner and on the assault bike as well so I will pop a link into the chat box for you guys to be able to head to the assault university page and be able to check that out and uh, actually dig into some of that education after this call Mike I'd love to bring you on first just to intro yourself and uh, give us a little bit of a heads up on why assault is putting out content like this for coaches uh, okay, so intro about myself. Um, I've uh, been in the fitness industry probably close to 15 years, uh, starting back when I was still in the military. So I was in the military from 2001 to 2005. Um, got out, um, started doing just some personal training and that kind of stuff. Uh, found CrossFit, got into CrossFit, um, and actually worked for the company for quite a bit of years, uh, left recently, and then started working with Assault to help build their um, education department. So what we really wanted to do was just start educating. Uh, so the goal with this education department wasn't just educating, you know, you know, athletes or coaches, it was creating, and that's what we're doing right now, is creating something that is more, um, Wow, the screen just starts going crazy. Uh, all encompassing. So we're starting off with stuff that's a little bit more forward facing. So, you know, how can we uh, teach people, you know, how to maintain the equipment, um, some basic service uh, videos on, you know, if something were to go wrong, how can you quickly fix it? Um, set up stuff. So how do I set up an athlete on, on the equipment? What are some basics in technique? And then finding experts, and this is where OPEX comes in, finding experts in the field, whether it be 
you know, fitness, or we might even look for something in team sports or health and wellness or people that are, you know, wrestling coaches and start finding these experts in the field that are using the equipment and uh, providing that knowledge to, to the community. And what's really cool is, is OPEX is the, the first, you know, group of experts that we've worked with. And, we, and I feel like uh, you guys have created some pretty amazing content uh, using our equipment, which I'm super appreciative for. But then on the back end of things, you know, our other goal is just to create something that uh, we can educate our own employees with. So, you know, making sure that everybody understands the ins and outs of the equipment. Uh, distributors, you know, that are international, uh, making sure that they understand everything about the equipment. So just having a, a good education uh, department that can uh, educate every aspect of our brand. That's been the goal. Oh, so thanks, Mike, so much for that uh, intro, and it kind of really sets the stage for why we are here today. Uh, Carl is going to be digging into some energy systems training principles to kick us off so we're all on the same page and speaking the same language. I see James is on the call, and I would actually love to bring James in because I know he has a long love affair with the assault bike and uh, has some pretty cool stories around it and what it's meant to him and his you know, personal evolution in fitness. James, do you want to just hit on briefly why you love the bike so much? A long love affair that sounds kind of weird. I'll just preempt with that. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it's, well, it's really hard work. I think that's what attracted me to it. Um, I felt like a kid again, just doing suicides, playing hockey, um, where it's just, you want to just, you just keep going after it because it's, uh, it makes you question what you're capable of. It's that kind of machinery. Um, and it's been around for a long time. You know, the concept of just the, the bike itself. Um, and, uh, salt has evolved it to the point that's made it like, you know, that, that piece of equipment that we all loved, but like had 12 versions. Um, and now it's just like one good version. Um, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to drown out the stories. I could give you 30 stories if someone wants to speak to me offline, uh, some cool stories around the bike itself. I'll stop there. <laughs> <clears throat> So thanks, James, for that briefly. And uh, Mike, I'll pull you in uh, just first of all to uh, set the stage and tell us a little bit about the different products you guys have, the bike, the runner, the rower, and uh, you know some of the key differences between them. Yeah, so uh, you know, we'll start off with the classic um, air bike. So the Assault air bike is um, a Stefan bike where we're using you know, atmospheric drag or, you know, the resistance of air against an object as a way to uh, create resistance. And that's essentially air against the fan, right? So as we know with, with the air bike, the faster you can get that fan going, the, the more power you can generate. Uh, the, the rower, which is behind me is, is similar to that. It is also an air brake ergometer. Um, the thing with our rower is it's, been simplified as uh, where we don't have a damper setting for it. So the air that's coming in is the air that's coming in. So what it's up to the athlete is just how quickly you can get that flywheel spinning to generate power. Uh, the air runner is a curved non-motorized treadmill. Uh, so that means that the runner itself kind of responds to the athlete. So, you know, a typical treadmill uh, the athlete kind of has to respond to the treadmill. So I'm sitting here pressing buttons and then it speeds up and I have to respond to that speed. So what's really cool about the air runner is that once I understand how to, to maneuver myself on this curve, this runner will respond to me. So as I get tired and I back off the curve a little bit, the thing slows down. When I'm really amped up and I'm running fast and I scoot up on that curve a little bit, this thing speeds up. So it's super responsive to the athlete, which is cool. Um, and then we have our elite bike. So the elite bike is an air bike, uh, that was built for, you know, big commercial gyms, gyms where a lot of people are going to be using it every day, but we don't have that coach, you know, watching over it and wiping it down after each session. So we made it bigger, a little bit more robust. We encapsulated the drivetrain, uh, cause we knew that people weren't going to be wiping off sweat all the time. So just something that kind of sit in the cardio section and be used over and over and over again and be super long lasting. So that was the idea behind the elite bike. Uh, and that's the four current products that we have on the market right now. 
Paul, thanks for hitting on those, Mike. And uh, obviously a really important part of using them for coaches is not just the technique on each piece of equipment, but also, you know, how to actually program design for them and make sure that the client gets something out of each piece of training. And that's where we're really going to bring Carl in now uh, to discuss. You there, Carl? Oh, sorry. Uh, you, froze. you froze. You oh. froze. I was like, uh, what, is, what is Georgia saying right now? Yeah, um, I don't know what that setup was because you you froze. Um, so I'm going to assume you said I'm going to start to hit on principles, right? Cool. Um, yeah, just so we're all speaking the same language and, and what we want to do here today uh, with Mike on the call. Um, if you check out uh, Assault Bike University, is that it, Mike? Um, I know you're putting out, I know you're putting out content every single day with, uh, with workouts and stuff like that. Is that correct? Yep. So on the, um, Instagram it's, uh, um, assault fitness underscore university. And then on our website, it's, you know, on the assault fitness website, if you scroll down bottom middle of the page, you'll see the university icon and you click on that and go to experts. And you'll see uh, the the air bike um, videos and course, and then very soon you'll see the um, air runner videos. Awesome, yep. And then on that IG page, I know Mike's putting out uh, daily workouts as he's uh, training from home. Which one um, I, I borrowed yeah. one from you recently. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I took, yeah. I took one from us uh, as an incremental pacing piece. So, yeah. Um, just so we're speaking the same language principally guys and what we're going to walk away with here today is uh, I want to talk about training utilizing the bike the rower and the runner at home of course you need to have one of those implements at home to utilize it um, but we're going to hit on those and, and and hit on our principles and how to use OPEX gain pain sustain which with each one of those implements so when we look at OPEX gain pain and sustain OPEX gain, we're talking about anaerobic alactic work. When we look at OPEX pain, we're talking about anaerobic lactic work. And then sustain, we're just talking about aerobic work. So just simply put, if we were to look at that power time curve on the right, look at gain as very, very high power that you cannot maintain for any given amount of time, essentially. So think about going really hard on bike or sprinting really hard for 10 seconds. And then when you get into that pain or that middle zone, uh, piece, think about going really hard for 60 seconds and it hurts really bad and you're lying on the ground, right? And then when we get to the right side of that curve and the sustains, let's look at something that we can sustain for a very long amount of time, or we can do really quick, high power output sets, let's say 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, and we can sustain the same power output over time. So what we want to talk about today is using these three principles in your at-home training and ideas of how to set up a weekly training program. So what we have here, just relative to those three training principles, is we have a seven-day split where we have two rest days and we're utilizing a high-low method. So you'll see on day one, we're gonna call that a high day where we're implementing OPEX gain and OPEX sustain on that training day. On Tuesday, we're going low, so we're just doing OPEX sustain work. Wednesday, we're back to high and we're hitting OPEX pain work, and it's intentional to have a rest day after OPEX pain. Thursday, we're resting. Friday, we're back to a high day where we're going to implement OPEX gain and sustain. Saturday, just OPEX sustain. And then finally, Sunday, we're resting. So to look at, to give you guys an idea of what that would look like, um, let's, let's look at Monday first where we're implementing OPEX gain and OPEX sustain. So OPEX gain, we're utilizing the air runner. So think about doing 10 second Excel. So think about starting that, like getting the, the belt going a little bit, starting a timer for 10 seconds and sprinting on the air runner, resting a really long amount of time and performing that for five sets. And then we're going into aerobic sustainable set work, utilizing the assault bike and just our body weight. Then on Tuesday, we're doing some, what we call it MAP 10, in our language, where we're just doing some of the world work, where I'm going one minute on the air runner at a very easy pace, then I'm doing a front leaning rest, then I'm going to the bike, then I'm doing lunges, and then I'm going to the rower, 
and then I'm doing single unders and I'm doing that one minute on, no minutes off. So this is just consecutive minutes from one implement to the other. And I'm doing that for eight sets. Then on Wednesday, you can see that we're performing an OPEX pain piece. So we're going three sets at hard effort. We're going 20 cal assault bike, 20 no jump burpees as fast as possible. And then we're going back to the assault bike for 20 cals. We're resting 12 minutes and we're doing that for three sets. So a lot of people will see 12 minutes rest and they'll be like, what do you, what do you mean? Right? So the effort in which we're approaching that amount of work, we should need that 12 minutes. If at eight minutes we're ready to go or six minutes, we're ready to go. You probably didn't approach that properly. So that's OPEX pain. And the, the, just the language around that pain should kind of tell you what you should look and feel like after every one of those three sets. Then on Thursday, we're resting. And then on Friday, we're doing OPEX gain and OPEX sustain again. But you can see one in A2, we're not utilizing any of the assault products. We're just gonna utilize some odd objects. Uh, so you can, if you go to Mike's page, he's using a lot of sandbags right now. So we could use that. You can use a backpack and you, you can use whatever you wanna do. But we're doing odd object goblet squats at a tempo. Then we're supersetting that with an odd object Z press. So just think about sitting on your butt with your feet right in front of you and you're just pressing an object overhead. So that would be OPEX gain. So we're doing that back and forth for four sets and then we do five sets at sustainable. So now we're doing aerobic or open sustain work. And that work's gonna be the assault bike to burpees, to jump squats, to push ups. We're resting about one to one. So we put a five minute rest and then we're doing that for five sets. And then finally on Saturday, we're back to a load. So we're doing easy map work, maximum aerobic power, and that's OPEX sustain. So we're going three sets at an aerobic effort, five minute walk on the air runner, five minute air rower, and five minute assault bike. And we're just doing that consecutive. So that look at that as 45 minutes of consecutive work. And notice that I put walking the air runner when we're looking at map 10 work because most people can't actually jog on air runner and make that sustainable for five minutes for three sets without resting at all. Depends, a lot of, some people can, but a lot of people cannot. So just take those things, take those things in consideration when you're designing your training programs. So if this is like a, you know, a great program or anything like that, we just wanted to give you an idea of what a high low method could look like utilizing the assault products. Carl, thanks for hitting on that. And uh, I wonder if you could go into a little bit of detail about what kind of a client might be doing a training session like this, and then also what clients you'd be looking at for gain versus pain versus sustain, and how you might blend those. Yeah, great question. I mean, we can we can get into you know our principles on uh, concurrent training and, and how we have it laid out. But just to be simple. Um, when we're, when we're considering doing OPEX pain, I know that you asked the question, what client is that appropriate for? Not many, right? So if your client doesn't need to do unsustainable pain work, I wouldn't add it in there. I just wanted to put it into this program so we understand how it would lay out in a week principally. Um, but if we look at principles of concurrent training, never do OPEX pain work before any other work to make it simple. You can do OPEX pain before OPEX sustain, or you can do OPEX sustain before OPEX pain. That's fine. Just don't throw OPEX pain prior to, to either one of those other two. And then the question on um, considerations of, you know, how this program design is laid out. And if, is there any person that, that we had in mind when we laid this out? Not really, I would just look at the exercise selection within there and understand the contraction and how that contraction is going to feel for the client that you're designing it for. So if you look at Monday, I did five sets at a sustainable effort and I put assault bike calories. Anyone should be able to make that somewhat sustainable based on the RPM that they're going at, right? Now we go to burpees, right? So is the burpee sustainable for your client? Can your client make that movement sustainable? If your client can't do a front leaning rest for 60 seconds and can't do a push up, probably not. So I wouldn't put a burpee there in sustainable work. That may be OPEX gain work, them doing FLRs and push ups to get better at that movement. When we go to jump squats, if someone can't perform 
an air squat with outstanding technique and perform 20 air squats with outstanding technique, you're not going to put jumps, jump squats in a sustainable piece for them. So I can go through all of these movements and kind of say the same thing and have the same commentary. But when you look at the exercise selection, make sure that the intention is, is appropriate. And then the same with OPEX pain work, right? If someone can't get her, right? Or if 20 no jump burpees is going to have someone on the ground, if they do that as fast as possible, because they're so deconditioned and they're going to get back on the assault bike and they're going to spin at 30 RPM, that's not OPEX pain right? Because they're not able to express that high power output over that entire amount of time. So it's just relative to what, what your client can express. So we have to understand what our clients can express. How can we understand that? We assess them. We work with them for a period of time and we understand what they're capable of and what they're not capable of. To dig in just a little bit to, uh, let's say the pain piece here, you've got three sets of hard effort there, Carl, on the assault bike, no jump burpees, and then assault bike. Uh, and you mentioned that, you know, if someone goes so hard that they can't continue um, and power output drops on that assault bike, that's probably not a good thing. What would you be looking for across those three sets for someone to be executing that appropriately? Yeah, I mean, we have three sets and we have 12 minutes of rest and we look at is the intention of having 12 minutes of rest between each of those sets. It's, it's to ensure that they can maintain the same amount of power output across those three sets. So there's a lot of confusion on repeatability and sustainability. This is not sustainable work, but it should be repeatable work based on the amount of rest that we have between each set. So let's say that um, this, this piece takes a, one of your clients three minutes and 30 seconds, set number one. And then set number two, it takes them four minutes. And then set number three, it takes them five minutes. That was that work was not repeatable. So they were not able to uh, have the exact same or a similar power output over those three sets. That means that they probably just came out of the gates a little bit too hard on set number one. And they need to do this session again next week and dial it back, right? So what we're looking for is repeatability, not necessarily sustainability, if that makes sense, Georgia. Yeah, absolutely. And if you were to compare that to what you were looking for in the sustained piece on, you know, say Monday, uh, you are looking for sustainability and repeatability there. Is that fair to say? Yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, James has been going uh, crazy in the chat box and I really appreciate that. He's dropping some good knowledge in there. But James, maybe you could pull, um, pull out those whys that you mentioned for gain, pain and sustain and talk on those a little bit. Yeah, the why, why do each area? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, well, the, the number one answer for all of them is that uh, you would want, you would, you know, the reason for doing each of them is I would hope to try to get good at each one of them. Um, but there's prerequisites. That's the issue that comes in front of most exercise prescription. So I want to be careful of, of talking only about the why without saying that there is a select few that can't do a number of them because there are prerequisites to doing each one, but you would want to do gain, what we call just short-term high expression, just to, just to try to express short-term high expression. That's the reason for doing it. Um, it's whatever you got stored, just think of it in the context of, uh, you know, just coming in and sitting on it and just ah, you know, fucking letting go everything. That's what gain is, is like put as much work into the smallest amount of time as possible to just get rid of stored energy. Um, now, if you were to think about what happens if I tried to extend that out further to the right, that's what pain is. So you're not gonna go, bah, you're gonna calm it down a lot, little bit and try to extend it further and further out, but there's essentially gonna come into some limitations that reach you into why we call it pain, because it's not only hydrogen ion pain, it's the pain of you going, fuck, should I stop or should I keep going? Uh, so there's cognitive pain inside of that as well. And why you should do that? Um, I put it into buckets of three areas. There's a bunch of other reasons. I wanna be careful as to people take that information, but it should be to get a metabolic adaptation. You know, if you decide to do it, you're, you should be doing it to get a metabolic adaptation. You should be doing it uh, to get stress. This is the area where I can go off and speak for three hours as to why not everyone needs stress. I won't, but if you wanna give stress, that's a great idea. Um, and then third, it could act as a booster to the aerobic system, which is complicated in its design and output, but I, you know, it really does work that way. And why do sustain is so that you can learn how to be aerobic. 
all the mechanisms around learning how to be aerobic are very positive um, and, and it's lengthy. So uh, I might stop there. Well, thanks for that, James. Uh, we do have some good questions coming in now, so I would like to start answering them. And we'll start with uh, Vincenzo. How would you avoid interference of those pieces with other workout pieces? Like for example, the mechanical and strength work, especially if that strength work is lower body focused. Yeah, I could start with that and then feel free to jump in from others' experiences. Um, yeah, you want to go back and look at the modality and say what's really being done in the modality. And the main, um, let's call it limitation to keep people moving is knee extension. So if you want to think about it, you know, you're not, you don't have an effectively high amount of recruitment around the ankle like you do box jumps or double unders, right? That just makes coaches think, well, what is actually happening that's really important? Um, it's knee extension that's coupled with hip extension, but hip extension is not so important because you're in an upright position and the angle relative to the femur is not that high. So then you need to say to yourself, really, where does this per person sit in their capability? That's largely what answers the question as to if you're going to get interference or not. Let me give you an idea. Matt Fraser can easily go from five minutes really hard on it and then clean 315 pounds, right? So people are like, oh, wow, then there's no interference. No, it's based upon your capability. So if someone's capable of sustaining work for five minutes, that seemingly to you looks really hard. To them, it's not that hard. So it comes down to what the person is capable without you forgetting that it really is a knee extension mechanism you got to be cautious of. In best principle, and I'll stop there because it could get lengthy. In best principle, this is why you need a coach because they can progress you through those skills that mix with the assault bike most effectively. And they don't just like give you random bullshit that looks really good and it's full of pain and that possibly could lead to injury because they're not thinking about that interference. So they're doing things like uh, box jumps, step downs, uh, uh, wall balls and uh, salt bike. And they're like, oh, that's real cool. That's savage. Yeah, now you got patellar tendonitis. So people are not thinking about that because there's that interference of someone not being able to express the box jumps and the wall balls as an aerobic mechanism and why Jacob Hepner may be able to do that for six hours straight. Again, it comes down to capability. Thanks for that, James. Uh, Mike, I'm sure you've probably spent more time on the rower bike and uh, runner than all of us uh, and would love to know if there are any considerations that you have for yourself when you're putting together, especially mixed paces to do in your garage gym. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think for, for the most part, um, it kind of falls in line with, with what James was saying. I mean, I, when I try to um, create a lot of workouts for myself, uh, I typically look for workouts or, or combine movements with the bike runner or rower that are more synergistic and less, and less interference um, now for my training. Uh, you know, I, I think there were definitely some times where I would create workouts where it looked like there was a little bit more interference from movement to movement, but at those times, um, there was a different, different level of training that I was putting myself through. Uh, but for now to get through, to get, to get through workouts that I'm, you know, preparing for myself, or even if we're doing stuff with people, you know, some of our people in the assault fitness gym, it's typically, you know, um, workouts where, uh, there's a lot more synergy between movements than interference. Yeah. And I mean, uh, especially getting sports specific, there are times where you need to be training stuff that is interfering and, uh, isn't necessarily complimentary. So, uh, yeah, you're, you're right there. Is your focus on training now, Mike, like a little bit more health focused or what is it for you? <laughs> yeah, totally health focused. Um, you know, there were, there was a little bit of a, a competition training starting last spring, ending in November. It was a big Thanksgiving day 5k between me and some family members where we've actually created a trophy. Uh, so I, kind of emphasized running on the air runner for uh, quite, quite a bit, um, kind of progressing, um, running just a little bit, you know, in April to, you know, still running about three times a week, but becoming more sophisticated with my programming as um, I kind of uh, adapted to the training, but uh, it worked in my favor and I ended up winning and taking home the family trophy. So pretty happy about that. Totally worth it then. Totally worth it. Cool. Um, there's some chat going in the there's some chat going on in the chat box right now about rest. 
stuff. So Sean had brought up the, the point that his clients hate it or don't understand rest. How do I get them to understand the long rest? Uh, I'd be happy to pull in any of you guys to comment on that and how to communicate the importance of rest periods uh, with clients. Carl? Uh, yeah, I think uh, James threw something in the chat box saying that um, it may be a good idea to go to the whiteboard with your clients and kind of educate them on what the intention is behind whatever that piece of work is. Um, but I, th I think it goes back to, um, I think it was Lucy asked in the chat box, um, something about the about clients not needing that amount of rest. Um, if the client can express what you're giving them, that should almost naturally answer that question, right? If you ask someone to go really hard for, let's say, you know, the, the let's say 10 seconds on the assault bike and they're just like, do, 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 like that didn't do anything for me. It's like what James said in the chat box is like, okay, yeah, don't like get them off of the assault bike, get stronger with weights and then make that. Right. So I think, uh, I think the, that you get from the training session almost answers the questions for your clients because if we look at actually express that appropriately they're not going to ask about the rest they're not going to say why do i need that much rest they're going to ask hey can I get a little bit more rest next time right so um if if we're not having that conversation or they're not having that conversation with us then i would look at uh the program and, and are you giving your clients what they can express now? So Carl, I think uh, you may have frozen a little bit. I don't know if it's my end or if Zoom is just freaking out again like it did yesterday. Uh, but I think most people probably got what you just said there. Uh, on that, if you are looking for someone uh, to be able to express, you know, gain on a bike, what would be a gain or pain? Like what would be a prerequisite? What should they be able to do? And I think we just left Carl. We, did we lose you? Uh, yeah, I'm back though. The same okay, thing happened well, yesterday. I just, it just says it kicks me out and puts me back in. Zoom is highly unsustainable right now. So to get back to the question I was just asking, uh, what would be a prereq you'd be looking for, looking at someone to, you know, go hard and express pain on the bike? Um, did you guys catch anything I said? Or did you, did you lose I, me completely? Previously, yeah, but I think she's asking a new question. Oh, got it. Okay. What was your question, Georgia? Yeah, Sorry. just uh, any specific prerequisites you'd look look at for someone to be able to express pain on a bike or on a runner or a roller. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've proposed we've proposed an, a number of things. One of those things being a body weight back squat. Um, you know, but it's it's you know when we look at strong enough, a lot of the time. I, I like to use the implement itself to understand if someone's strong enough to express it, right? I think that's the simplest way, right? So, um, you know, James just put in the, ch the chat box on the body weight back squat, three, three strict dip, strict pull-ups. Um, and let's say someone has those, right? Those, uh, those prerequisites, and then they jump on the bike and they're still not able to express it. And we, is it something mechanically that they're doing on the bike or on the row or, or on the runner that's actually limiting power or they're, they're leaving a lot of power on the table because of something mechanically that they are or not doing? So I think there's a lot of different variables that we can look at. But I think what James put in the chat box on looking at if someone's strong enough is a great starting point, but it, it, you may not end there, if that makes sense. Yeah, Carl, thanks for that. Uh, so we will get into some Q&A shortly, um, but Mike, I did just want to pull you back in. I think there's a lot of people training at home right now that may not have access to, you know, any equipment and are probably looking to have a bike or a rower or a runner, you know, in their homes or perhaps for their clients. And I know you'd mentioned earlier that Assault has some cool offers going on right now. Would you mind just explaining those and then we'll dig into the Q&A after that? Yeah, for sure. So um, there is a sale going on for Assault products. Um, currently right now, the classic bike is uh, $649. Uh, the Elite bike is uh, $1099, so $1099, but it also comes with a Bear Complex Assault vest, um, sorry, weight vest. 
And the air rower is $12.99, which also comes with a weight vest. And then the air runner is $34.99, uh, which comes with a weight vest. And once again, those weight vests are from Fair Complex. So kind of gives people the opportunity to, you know, grab um, one of the assault products, but also, you know, something extra that they could use in their workouts. Um, they can, you know, especially with something like the, the rower or the bike or the runner, you know, you can throw this thing in your garage or living room and, you know, have two pieces of equipment that you can get a decent amount done um, or accomplished uh, when you're in a pinch, right? So uh, we're just trying to provide very quick home gym setup while, uh, while the stuff is going on until things come back to normal. Oh, thanks for that, Mike. And I just popped in uh, the chat box, Mike's contact info, and then also place for sales questions for assault. So guys, hit them up uh, if you are looking to fit out and a uh, home gym for yourself. Uh, we couldn't recommend the equipment more. We all use it in the gym every day. Uh, so guys, we will get into Q&A. So please feel free to uh, pop anything in the chat box if you have questions. Uh, Mark says, anything for UK-based folk? Uh, Mike, you may be able to answer that. I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah, unfortunately, right now it's in the continental uh, US for for this uh, specific promotion. Thanks, Mike. Guys, as we wait for questions to come through, uh, James, Jim, Carl, Mike, anything you guys would like to add? No, nothing specifically. I mean, I've I think I've I have an assault bike in my backyard and I've used it 10 straight training sessions. So yeah, keep, sh keep <laughs> sharing. Them, man. I, I love seeing creativity. <laughs> I do have a question for each of you. Uh, gun to your head, which would you pick a rower, a bike or a runner and why? Um, I think I think I'm biased towards the runner, just because I I love the thing. I don't know. I just love. I like training on it. Um, I've spent a lot of time on it. I've gotten to the point where I can I can train on the runner any way that I would train over ground in terms of you know low intensity steady state training, uh, sprinting. Um, not to mention, it gives me a chance to run when the kids are sleeping and napping and you know, if it's raining and I, I just enjoy running. So I think, I think the, the, the runner uh, would be the one I pick. I enjoy running, but I don't know if you remember James back in the old days, running was definitely my weakness when we used to compete together. So if only I enjoyed uh, running back in those days, maybe things would have changed a little bit. <laughs> well, that's a lesson we can all change, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. Anyone else? I said the runner because I think it's uh, philosophically a better uh, function of, of, of assessment, like functional assessment. Um, that gets, of course, makes people uncomfortable, but um, I don't think if you can get across land um, and if you're doing it on the runner, you can still, I would argue, do it on land. Um, I think there's, uh, I think you got more problems coming to you. Whereas, whereas, just be cautious now. Um, if you row or bike, it's the reason why there's a shit ton of people buying $10,000 bikes when they're 60, right? Um, it's easy to do. Now, be careful. Be careful. Um, it doesn't mean running's greater, but it's just a kind of a conceptual assessment of what you can and cannot do. So I think running is primal, and that would be my choice. Here for the runner. I, I hear what they're saying. <laughs> But I would I would still choose the bike for uh, for myself for versatility and also because I'm just a I just love running on the street when I can or running around a mountain when I can I love running on the air runner but uh, I'd probably pick a bike. Carl, oh, you're up. Um, yeah, for for myself or for people for others. Come on, oh, diverting. <laughs> That's a hedge. No, a they're, hedge. they're different. They're, they, I think they'd be different. No, they'd be the same answer, but for different reasons. Okay. I'll give you both. I'll give you both. No. As we, wait for, as we wait for questions. Seconds. You've been cutting off the call all the whole time. You get eight seconds. <laughs> oh, one answer. I'd choose the bike. Thank you. Um, hey, let's move on. No, no, no. <laughs> I'd choose the bike because 
I feel better doing it. A, I like to run on the road. I still like to run on the, the runner in the gym, but I like to run on the road, but I choose the bike because of versatility. It's just super versatile. Um, and it's like, you know, I can organize pacing a little bit better on the bike than I can on, uh, than I can on the runner and rowing is good. I love rowing, but I, I would bike over rowing any day. Well, thanks for that, Carl. I would also vote for the bike, but just because I have a janky knee. <laughs> Too much jujitsu, Georgia. Long before jujitsu. It was my soccer years back when I was five or six years old. How dare you call it soccer? <laughs> I know. Shame on me. Guys, we had uh, one question from Austin in the chat box that I may, I think we might need him to expand upon it a little bit. He says, can you talk more on the resistance generation again? This is my first time being introduced to a salt bike. I think that's a Michael uh, G um, answer. Question was on resistance. Yeah, I think he's asking about the flywheel. Uh, just talk about mm. uh, maybe the concept as to what, because uh, if he hasn't been on one, remember it's, you know, to us, we all think everyone understands the, uh, the physics that's going on there, so. Sure, sure. So simply air creates drag or resistance. Um, so if, you, if you've seen the assault bike, it has a cage and then it has fan blades. And as that fan is going around, it's pulling air into the, the fan, okay? So uh, what I had mentioned before is probably a little bit more of a, a technical term, but it's atmospheric, at, atmospheric drag. And that's, that is the air resistance against a moving object. So the faster we can get that object, which is in, in this sense is the fan blade. It's the faster we can get that thing to move, the more air we can pull in, the more air we're pulling in, the more resistance we're creating against um, the fan. Uh, so which also means that the faster I can get that thing to move, which is, we're talking about RPMs here, the more my wattage is, is gonna go up, so the more power I'm generating. Uh, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. It looks like Austin says, yeah. Perfect. Cool. Guys, if uh, any more questions, feel free to pop them in the chat box. We can hang out for another minute. And I will pop in the chat box now uh, one more time that link to be able to head to Assault University's page. Uh, the air bike course, uh, Assault bike course is up there right now. And then the air runner course is coming there soon. You can have a peek at it on our YouTube if you want to now, it's sitting there, um, but it will be up on the uh, Assault University page very soon. So please check it out. It should be a really valuable way for you guys to get a bit of learning in while you are stuck at home. Um, so hopefully a good time for it. All right, looks like there are no other questions coming in. So guys, we will wrap it up there. Uh, tomorrow we will be getting back on the call with Carl. Uh, we're gonna be digging into OPEX gain uh, at home. So some resistance training uh, at home. It looks like Sean just popped something in. Do lines blur between pain and sustain? Speaking as a cyclist. Yeah, that that is a, uh... Uh, it can uh, when someone gets far more powerful, Sean. Um, for a cyclist, in terms of what a cyclist operates as and how they self-select for what cycling does, um, and take this the right way, people, if they choose to do cycling, they, they're not that fast twitch. So they don't have a lot of power actually can be possibly generated inside them. Um, and of course, you can that gets blurry because we're talking about two continuums, but... Um, as it's expressed and how it's designed, there's two very clear differentiating things between pain and sustain. Um, and the way that you wanna think about it to formulate a progression for yourself or for other people is that pain is done with the intention of actually being unsustainable. So it's work that you're trying to do. So there's an end point of actually stopping. And with regards, to, and I'll give you an example. You can do, and I'll, I'm, I'm going to bastardize this, but just be careful of wattage. So you're going to do one minute at 525 watts, right? 525 watts, where in the 10 seconds after that minute, you can barely move, barely move. Like you can't even turn your legs around. Okay. So that's considered a painful one minute. If you did a sustain one minute, you should be able to do one minute at 390 watts. See the difference in, in output there? Rest for a minute, 
and repeat that same power for another minute. Whereas the person who did the minute at, a, at 520 watts should take them five, six, seven, fuck, 15 minutes to be able to come back and to do the same amount of one minute work. So there's the differentiation between what's inside the pain versus sustain. But because you said cyclist, it does shake it up a tiny bit because it self selects for enduring athletes. Actually, I'll back up. I should say if it's Kieran or 1K, um, that could change things up. So I assumed it was long distance. I apologize. Thanks for jumping on that one, James. Guys, anything else to add to that? All right. Guys, we'll leave it there for today. We will be back on tomorrow. Uh, so looking forward to that conversation uh, again with Carl talking about OPEC gain and resistance training at home. Uh, please make sure if you haven't already, send uh, your friends the invitation to this conversation. We do want to get as many coaches on the call as possible so we can share ideas and all benefit from it. Uh, looking forward to tomorrow, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mike. It was great to have you on. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. All right. Bye. Bye, guys.